This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Aquarium Mania. I'm your host, Dr. Roy Anong, speaking to you from the University of Florida's Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. Thanks for joining us. Improvements in the science of fish keeping have been only part of the hobby's success. Advances in aquatic pet products, including aquarium systems, nutrition, water quality, and salts have been critical to driving both fresh and saltwater fish interests. My guest today, Tim Plafkan, is Senior Product Manager at Spectrum Brands, which includes Marineland, Tetra, Instant Ocean, and Jungle products. Join us as we discuss aquatic pet products, past, present, and future. We'll be right back after these messages. Put on a perfectly possum pet party. Having an awesome birthday or adoption day celebration for your four-legged friend? Or just want a fun excuse to throw a fun party with your friends from the dog park? Deck out your party with Molly and Bandit Pet Party Accessories, party products designed specifically for pets. There are wearables, including adjustable pet party hats, bow ties, and tutus. The photo prop kits include funny glasses and hats. The party supplies and decorations include coordinating table covers, party banners, cake decorations and treat bowls, cups and bags. Everything you need to create great memories and Instagram-worthy photos. They're available in two colorful themes, Tropical and Fireman. It's a dog's life. Celebrate it with Molly and Bandit Pet Party at mollyandbanditpetparty.com slash pet life. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Aquarium Mania on Pet Life Radio. My guest today is Tim Plafkant, Senior Product Manager at Spectrum Brands. Hey, Tim, thanks for joining us today. Hello, hello. Glad to be with you. Well, Tim, I know we've known each other for for a number of years, and I'm sure you've had enough of my humor, And, and uh, but I've definitely appreciated all the work you've done and your company has done for the industry. With this podcast, you probably know I like to ask some kind of in-depth personal questions. Hopefully, uh, you're good with that. Nothing too crazy. But my first question is, when did you get your first fish and aquarium in? What was your setup like, if you remember? And how old were you? Well, that one's easy. Even though my memory's going, I still remember that tank like the back of my hand. It was one of the old stainless steel meta frames. Maybe uh, you're probably too young, I guess, to even remember those, right? Oh, I remember meta frames. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> I don't feel too bad then. Yeah. On the old wrought iron stand, I had the, um, oh, what was that thing called? The Silent Giant, the air pump with the tin can in it. Okay. I think it was just a, a corner box filter, but I had, uh, I think, a red tail shark and a few other guys at the time, and I loved it. I was probably eight or so. Uh, okay, cool. So like about 100 years ago. That's great. Exactly. I'm not going to lab- label any dates or anything here. <laughs> so, I don't want anybody doing the math. So what were some of the influences early on that made you interested in the hobby? Well, mainly it was my dad. He uh, got me into it, but also just being in Southern California, just being around the ocean, it was just something, you know, it was part of our life. I don't know, I even know how my dad got into it. I wish he was here. I could ask him, but I'd probably lay it all on his shoulders, unfortunately. Did he do anything aquatic related or it just where you guys were living? Yeah, just living in Southern California. I think he just wanted a pet and being in an apartment. The fish were uh, one of the best options. And here we are a few years later and they're still a big part of my life. Now, I know in the bio when we were talking and emailing back and forth, you mentioned that you had spent some time in the Marshall Islands. So what was all of that about? What did you end up doing? What were you there for? I can also blame my dad for that one, too. He uh, was working for McDonnell Douglas and got a contract to work out there. So I was probably you know, in 10, 11, somewhere in that range. So I was a young kid, but it was an amazing. My memories of that place were just phenomenal. We lived on an island called Kwajalein. It was three miles by a half mile wide. So as a parent goes, I guess you really just let your kids go free range. So I don't remember any rules. I was all over that island. We go shark fishing and snorkeling and lots of seashells. I have a huge shell collection, but it was really good memories. I hope to take my kids out there someday. Well, how old were you again? I, I forgot if you mentioned that. Uh, yeah, then 10, 11, uh, up through 12, 13. So right when we're getting ready to leave is just when I started to be eligible for scuba diving. But the first couple of years were all snorkeling. Cool. So you said you also taught high school in, uh, in California, a science. How was that for you? And do you have any favorite stories as a teacher there? 
Yeah, it was it was good. Huntington Beach High School. So any of those people out there, uh, it was a great place. Again, it's close to the ocean. And I'm trying to think of my stories, but more than anything, it was kind of heartwarming. There was this one girl, really quiet, back of the class, had all these piercings, had the big Doc Martens. If, have you ever seen those? And they were all painted with um, Alice in Wonderland. I just thought she was kind of an, an odd creature. But turns out she was one of the nicest. She was a straight-A student. It was kind of one of those lessons of life where, you know, don't judge people, but she was one of the best kids ever. Where, you know, coming into it as a young kid out of college, I'm like, oh, who's this crazy girl? So that was just one of my lessons learned more than anything. Other than that, lots of dissections, just having fun in class. That was pretty neat. Now, you probably, so, so long ago, you probably don't know where any of those kids are now today, do you? I don't, unfortunately. I wish I knew that that girl's name and where she was. She kind of, uh, like I said, taught me a lesson in life, which was neat. So you were teaching for, uh, I guess, a couple of years, and then you decided to leave. Tell us a little bit about that. What made you decide to leave? Yeah, I was at Huntington High for right at two years, and then just I had worked at a fish store through college, so I had some contacts in the industry, and they gave me a call one day and said, hey, selling aquarium products is a lot like teaching. We need some people that kind of know uh, filtration and the bacteria and kind of get into the, the science of it. And I, at first I, I declined, said, no, I'm, I've got a good career. And they just talked me into it between a little bit more money and the travel and the adventure and all that. And I'm kind of glad they did. It just lured me away. It was neat. I'm assuming the, uh, the kids in high school were probably sad to see you go. <laughs> probably not. I don't think I was too mean or too strict, but yeah. No, there. I didn't have a, any one student that would probably uh, yell at me. Okay, I'm sure there was a fan there, probably some, you know, someone you didn't know about. So we'll pretend. We'll pretend. I'll that. hope. There you go. It's been so long. <laughs> I don't even remember. So now you you leave, and then you're into a completely different kind of uh, obviously workplace. So what were some major challenges and rewards when you left and joined Marineland? I guess and then Tetra. Yeah. So you know, when you're teaching high school, it's very eight to five, you've got to be there, the bell rings, then all of a sudden going out and and working in sales where you're on your own, you make your own schedule. That was a bit of a challenge at first, but after probably the first six months, you realize the freedom was just fantastic and setting your own schedule. Got to go to places like Puerto Rico and pretty much all over the continental U.S. So the travel and all that were great, but it was, it's a very um, open job, if you will. It's not regimented like a desk job, I guess. So that part was kind of neat. And then same thing with Tetra. Tetra was also in sales, but it was traveling more to grocery drug mass and learning how the big guys worked, how they do line reviews and how, you know, just the overall category, the management of of their pet sets and how they do business. So a lot to learn. It was pretty neat though. So you did make a move. You moved a couple of times. You mentioned a move to New York and something happened on top of the Empire State Building. What, what was that? What was that all about? Yeah, my wife asked me to move to New York with her. She had a job out there and Tetra was gracious. They let me live anywhere. So while we were there, I thought this would be the great place to propose to her. Right on top up there, it took us a while. I had to time dinner reservations and you had to have a reservation to get up to the lookout platform on top of the Empire State Building. And, and I'm sure you know what it's like to be that nervous. So we're on the corner on the very top and I'm trying to pull out this ring which was my entire life savings at the time and uh, I'm up on the edge and I fumbled it in my hands and I thought that thing was going over the side. I saw my life flash in front of me but luckily it stayed in my hand and she said yes luckily also. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> More importantly, so, so yeah, I guess I guess if it went over the side, then then yeah, you would have had a different fate. But that's, that's <laughs> that awesome. would have been it the, worked out. yeah, it did work out. So trying to think back a little, and then we'll talk, you know, a little more obviously uh, present and future. But what were some of your favorite products way back when you first started, and some maybe that were considered, you know, really innovative at the time. Gosh, at, at the time, I remember uh, moving into power filter from the you know, the old bubblers and the corner filters. I think my first one was um, DynaFlow, but it was that you know magnet where you had to oil the motor and everything. It worked really well, but man, that thing was was loud. But it was just easy to clean and, and get to. So that part I remember, and that was really the dawn of of power filters. And now they they've got the silent motors where no oil or any of that stuff. So that's probably my earliest memory of of some of the technology. Are any any products that are no longer around memorable? Anything you can think of that, that maybe were ones that probably shouldn't have been around? That should not have been around. Yeah, or or, or ones that <laughs> well, or ones that you liked. I guess any products that are no longer around that maybe were kind of failed concepts, or any that were ones that you missed. Yeah, I'd say the old classics are still around. I miss the old uh, Silent Giant air pump just because that thing really was quiet. It was a beast, and they just kept going for years and years, it seemed like. But yeah, one of my first cancer filters was a very old Eheim, and I, I think I had that thing running for like 10 years. So some of the, the good brands and stuff, they're still out there. They're still kind of doing similar stuff. 
So can you describe a little bit about how the industry has split and conglomerated, joined up over the years, and, and uh, specifically your company, Spectrum Brands, how they've played a role in all of that? Yeah, I mean, you've been a part of this too. It's probably the last 10 to 15 years has really been a lot of a lot of that, actually. Thankfully, I got in in the early stages. Bob Sherman was the owner of Marineland at the time, but I got to meet some of the early pioneers and private owners. And then Warner Lambert bought Tetra, and we kind of became part of a big pharmaceutical company, which for me was neat because they had really good training and HR benefits. And it was, it was kind of nice being in a corporate world. Um, a lot more structure as far as growing their employees. And now we're just seeing a lot more of it. Not, you know, it kind of started with Warner Lambert and Tetra. And now we have, we're owned by Spectrum Brands, which owns Black and & Decker and Railback and all kinds of stuff. So we, we get to talk to other product managers. We were just talking to a guy that made, works on the George Foreman line of grills. And so you get to learn a lot of different things from people. So that's probably the biggest benefit from the big corporations. But I do, you know, miss some of the passion and whatnot of the private owners that used to be out there. Yeah, I guess there would be potential for maybe quote unquote cross pollination of just ideas and in various aspects of the of the business. Oh, absolutely. That's what we're working on hard and heavy. We've got all kinds of neat technologies. Even just our LED, we've got LED flashlights under Rayovac and so you kinda learn a little little pieces from each other, which that's the part I really like. Now coming back to you, well how would you describe your role as a senior product manager? What do senior product managers do and, and specifically with the aquatics? So from my standpoint, it's all about the products. Um, I call it, you know, giving birth, so to speak. You're, you're raising and growing this baby. I work with the R&D folks. So it goes from conception and some of the ideas, test things out in the lab. So I've got to work with all, all the technical folks, whether it's engineering or the chemistry or even the biology department we have. But then I also have to work with the finance people and the packaging engineers and the artists. And now our, our big thing is um, really working a lot on the legal side and making sure trademarks and patents. And so I also get to work with, with lawyers on contracts. So it's a pretty diverse job and that's why I love it. But uh, you really have to kind of know a little bit about each one of those, those disciplines. And then in the end, everybody comes together and we hopefully have a really successful product launch. When you see the product up actually on the shelf in the store, it's kind of a neat day. Is Spectrum Brands International? I assume it would be, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In yes. fact, they just bought Iams Yukonuba for Europe. So that was kind of one of the big expansions. But yeah, Rayovac is big. I think the batteries over there is called Varda. But yeah, we're a global conglomerate. So how does that work? I'm just curious on kind of the legal side. I'm guessing in some of the countries, it's probably difficult. Yeah, thankfully, I don't have to do that. I focus on, on the U.S. We have our own team here that does that. Um, and then the legal side for any kind of um, global expansion of the products, they handle that, whether it be trademarks of names or patents and things like that. So it gets a little uh, over my head for sure. All right. Well, let's go back kind of to the aquariums and uh, aquarium tanks, equipment, etc. How would you say aquarium tank design has changed over the years? And you know, what did people kind of want then and what do they want now? Well, in some ways, I would say they've changed very little, which is kind of sad. I mean, there's still rectangle boxes sitting on top of a, a stand, in many cases, two by fours and whatnot. You are seeing a lot more of the systems and kind of more modern designs where the filtration's built in and things like that. But I would say in general, you know, it's when you're talking filtration and, and the, the life support, the mechanical, chemical, and biological filtration, it hasn't changed at all. The techniques and the premise is all about the same. Uh, me personally, I'd like to see a lot more design in the aquariums and the stands and all that. There's some companies out there doing a really good job, but they're also usually really expensive. So I'd like to see, see more of that, I guess, grow and, and uh, make it more attractive, if you will. But it hasn't okay. changed much. Okay. Well, you know what? Let's take a short break, and then we'll continue our discussion with Tim Plavkan of Spectrum Brands after these messages from our sponsors. Listen, cat people, it's just litter. Until you realize those big boxes mean big smells, big messes, and big money. Switch to World's Best Cat Litter, the only litter with concentrated power. It guarantees less smells, less work, all with less litter. Try the small bag that lasts one cat 30 days and you'll realize it's just litter. Unless it's World's Best Cat Litter. Find it at Target, Walmart, and at your local grocery and pet stores. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. We're 
Welcome back and continuing our conversation with my guest, Tim Plafkan of Spectrum Brands. Hello, so, Tim, hello again. Hey, Tim. So we started talking a little bit about kind of going back to the systems and tanks. Now, you mentioned the tanks and filtration. So the filtration hasn't changed too much either. or I, I, There seem to be kind of some maybe design changes. Can you maybe even talk about some of the changes that have occurred while you've been in, uh, in the business? Yeah, sure. So, you know, the chemistry is, is the same. It's kind of the same bacteria and whatnot that have to break down the waste. But from the filtration standpoint, earlier on, I was talking about my old DynaFlow with the motor you had to oil. And ever since we've migrated to the electromagnetic type motors where you don't have to oil, they're just virtually silent. You know, I, even today I get people that call and say, hey, my motor's not working. I'm like, well, just take the impeller out and clean it. And they're kind of shocked. Like, really? That's, that's the only moving part? So from that standpoint, they've gotten a lot simpler, a lot easier to maintain, quieter, you know, smaller, slim. I think just slow progress over over the years has made it a lot easier to work with versus the old you know under gravel filters and the corner filters you had to really reach your hand in there and tear them apart clean them up the basics are all the same but they've just the mechanics of it have really improved throughout the years which is nice going back into um, you know reaching back into kind of your chemistry background and, and obviously your awareness of the biofiltration how would you say the general public has improved or not improved or is there any better understanding you think in general or do you think the hobby has kind of progressed with the, their understanding of things like biofiltration I think it's really kind of forked if you will I think there's a big group where they're just busy families and they just they don't want to understand biofiltration or the, the mechanics going on they just want it to work so that's one big segment of our business anyways is just keeping it simple you know if you tell them what to do you tell them when to change the cartridge or tell them when to add water conditioners they'll do it and then they just want to be successful and have beautiful fish and then there's a whole nother group that take it more as a hobby and they want to learn more about the fish and how to, you know, what's going on behind the scenes, if you will. And I would say that group, they've really learned a lot. I've seen a lot more conversations about the bacteria and, you know, trying to understand what the autotrophs are and the heterotrophs. So they really kind of get into it, which I like. So I would say for me growing up as a hobbyist, you tried to learn about the fish a little bit. And then today you're just seeing a real kind of a clear segment as far as families that don't want to get into it, you know, the science of it, if you will. And then now, especially with the reef crab, and coral frags and all that, those people are just really taking the hobby to another level, which is something I never saw in my lifetime, which is neat. That's a really nice segue into my next question for you, which is about the marine hobby. The marine hobby definitely has evolved you know, over the past, I guess for you, uh, we'd say 100 years, right? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so Unfortunately. Um, with uh, you know, a lot more technology, you know, all some of the things you mentioned, I'm going to you know, ask you to maybe talk a little bit about, but can you maybe discuss how you know the marine aquarium hobby has evolved, I guess, since you've been in the business, in, including things like lighting and you know, the salts, and, and also a little bit about the role of Instant Ocean in the hobby? Yeah, that, that was a big question. I would say starting with Instant Ocean, I've learned a lot just working on the, the brand, the product portfolio, and kind of seeing some of the old documents from the early scientists, and I'm just really impressed with the formula. They put a lot of work into it, and now using it for the last 10 years, really, I kind of see what they're talking about. It's just, you know, being successful. The animals do really well. So, I mean, I just attribute that to our, our founding fathers and kind of knowing what they were doing. They spent a lot of time raising clownfish and, and tweaking the formula, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. But, yeah, now with the, the kind of coral craze and the, the reef hobby, if you will, we have a product called Reef Crystals that's really popular that has higher calcium and magnesium to really push the growth of the corals. I mean, some of these tanks you've seen, you've seen them. The photos are just amazing with the colors and the growth rates. It's, it's almost like gardening on steroids. They're crazy. How about a little bit about the lighting? You mentioned a little bit about LEDs, but what kind of maybe a little bit about trends with lighting. Yeah, it's all LED from our standpoint. Um, you know, we also make aquariums that were under Perfecto and now under the Marineland brand. Um, and, you know, back in our day, it was all either incandescent screw in or, or move into fluorescent. But I would say everything we do now is all about LED from the very beginner all the way up to the reef type lighting. Um, and now these guys with the LEDs are getting to the point where they can really dial in the color spectrum. They can play with seasons. Um, they can do all kinds of things. So I think from that standpoint, the LED is just going to take us to the future, which I so like. We, are there any specific brands you guys are, are marketing that are you know, a particular interest? Well, from the lighting standpoint, Marineland is our biggest brand that we sell LEDs through. Like I said, anything from real inexpensive LEDs for just basic fish tanks all the way up to our reef style lights that are much higher and brighter, you know, that have a lot of the blue 
to, for the, the coral growth. We haven't really jumped into the, you know, $2,000 sets of lights like I was talking about where you can kind of control them with the color spectrum. I'm hoping we do someday, but it's also, you know, meeting the masses and, and making money for the company. And right now, um, that mainstay and just affordable type reef LED lights is where, where we're at. And that's all through Marineland. Then Tetra, we also have some LED lights, but again, more for fish tanks and things like that, just kind of real basic lighting. But the nice thing in the LEDs will last 10 years, so you're not changing light bulbs, which is neat. Now, another major area of importance, of course, is uh, test kits for testing water quality. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of test kits and maybe some of the changes that have occurred over the years? And also yeah. maybe some products as well. Oh, it's changed a lot. You know, when I was working in the fish store, we would sell a lot of, at the time they were by Lamont, but they were probably 50 to to $100 kits just for ammonia, you know, just for one thing at a time. So people were, they took it very serious and they really invested in their kits. And then Tetra, we had a full line of, you know, the liquid type kits and it was a little more affordable around 30 to $50 depending on the kit. But I'll tell you over the last 10 years, that hobbyist has really changed. They just don't want to spend an hour a week testing their aquarium. And in fact, the liquid business for us anyway, is we've eliminated completely and we've switched over to all the test strips that kind of comes from the pool industry where you just dip the test strip in and you can get the results for alkalinity and, and nitrite and things like that. So on one side, I like the convenience factor on it, but the other side is where people are really getting into the chemistry. I don't see it as much. Again, you see it with the reef guys and some of the advanced hobbyists, but they're not the, the mainstay, if you will. So it's just really changed going to convenience factor. Now, you guys also do a lot, obviously, with um, nutrition and fish foods. Can you maybe give us a little uh, overview of how that has changed and some of the importance with nutrition that your companies deal with? Yeah, so that working with our folks in Germany has been a great learning experience for me. Um, the team in Germany, they're amazing. They've been doing this a long time, and really that's you know the founding fathers of flake food, if you will. But they don't just rest on their laurels. They're always looking for new things, and they're, they're working with prebiotics and inulin and all kinds of other additives just to really boost the, the immune system of the fish or to get them to live longer, better colors, better growth rate. So, you know, our flake food has always been a, an industry standard that fish love. People always come back and say, for some reason, my fish just always go crazy after Tetra. So they've got the stimulants in it. But what was neat, gosh, it was probably about 10 years ago when they came up with our crisp technology. Dr. Kutzinger out in Mele, um, it's kind of a cold-pressed pellet, if you will, that turns into a flake. And so that was neat. It was fun going through the training and having all the, the R&D folks here talking about the heat and preserving some of the vitamins. They were also able to tweak the fat and protein ratios to get kind of maximum growth. So it was neat seeing what they do every day. And they're just feeding fish nonstop looking for different formulas that have better results. So, you know, they've got thousands of tanks with fish everywhere in Germany. And when I got to go see that, finally, that was really a nice treat. So when you say all the crisps are basically cold pressed to kind of make sure preserve they're more of the nutrients, you know, the vitamins right. and some of the amino acids will break down at higher heat. So it's a much lower heat process. That was a big, I would view it anyway as a big um, innovation for Tetra. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. I know you guys have also been really involved and supportive with education and research. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, a lot of it's come through our marketing department. I know some of my old bosses, they worked with SeaWorld, and we had free aquarium kits that were actually SeaWorld branded that we'd give to schools. And then we had another program called Aquademics. We partnered with Petco on, and I forget the number, but it was almost about a 1,000 kits a year were going out to schools, you know, just free just to get, you know, for the learning environment. I think we even had a, a lesson plan booklet we could do back then. The kind of the interest fizzled down a little bit, both from our standpoint and the schools. It was a lot of work. We still obviously support it. We get requests all the time from teachers and, you know, we'll send them kits or, or products or salt or, or things like that just to keep the, the momentum there. But you almost have to have a partner like a Petco or somebody to really help bring it full circle. And then um, I obviously have to thank you guys for all the support for Rising Tide that you guys provide, at least with, um, you know, with us in this instant ocean. And it's a pleasure for us to do it, and especially when I get to come visit and see some of your animals you have out there. I think last time I saw some purple tangs that were the size of, I don't know, Shaquille O'Neal's hand. Those things were gorgeous. And some of the baby angelfish that I think you uh, got to see as well. Yeah. Were they the crayons? Was that it? They were the um, semicircle, I think. They were, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that so was neat. another kind of big, broad question. You know, you can take, you know, three or four hours if you need to answer this. So what do you think is the future of the hobby? And what do you think will be needed to kind of increase interest in the hobby, you know, in general? Yeah, that's a good question. 
some days I get a little depressed where I feel like the hobby is not the same as it used to be where, you know, where it was a hobby. People would really take it serious. And kind of I was mentioning before how you get the busy families that just want things to work. And they just want the prettiness of a fish, which is great. But I also want people to kind of learn about the aquatic environment, learn about the animals and kind of understand what's going on. So I'm hoping we can get back to that somewhat. I really am excited about the, um, the reef hobby. I think those people are getting into the science of it, you know, and they're perpetuating it, like I said, almost like gardening and, and bring it to another level. From our standpoint, you know, from a marketing standpoint, we really need to look at the younger generation and it's all about digital and apps and things like that. So we're looking at ways we can better interact with aquariums, you know, whether it's digitally or some other way, but just to take them to another level. Hopefully we can figure it out and get something that resonates with the, the younger kids, but that's our biggest challenge at this point. But I'm optimistic. I, I think we'll get there. Are you doing any selfies with aquariums or, or sending out vines or Instagrams? <laughs> any of that See, that's the problem. <laughs> Not me, but yes, we do have interns that do that. Uh, maybe we've got, we've got Facebooks and all that. They're the ones who kind of do the maintenance of that. I, I should be better about that, but unfortunately, I'm acting like an old fuddy-duddy, and I don't keep up with the vines, whatever you were mentioning. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so, final question. Do you have any final words of wisdom for our listeners? You know, we've got a kind of broad range of folks listening out there from beginner to more advanced to maybe even industry folks. Well, just the fact that they're listening to your your show and trying to learn more about the hobby, number one, kudos. And those are the kind of people I would love to meet and partner with. I think they're just like my dad, you know, got me started in the aquarium. I'm hopeful that they kind of not only spread the word of really enjoying aquatic pets, but also how to better learn about the environment and some of the neat things that happen. So I think your listeners, that's the kind of group we really want to focus on because they are the ones who will share and spread, but, you know, spread the knowledge so everybody's successful. That's a big thing we want is, you know, keep fish happy and healthy and enjoy them. Thanks very much, Tim. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I do want to thank you, Tim, again, and our producer, Mark Winter, for making the show possible. Please be sure to check out Tim's company's webpage. The link will be on Aquarium Mania. I encourage all of you to visit my Aquarium Mania blog on Pet Life Radio. And also, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for a show, email me at Dr. Roy, that's D R R O Y, at petliferadio.com. Dr. Roy at petliferadio.com. Until next time, please visit your local aquarium stores, keep your tanks clean and your fish healthy, and be sure to check out the full line of Spectrum Brands products. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.